Hello and welcome to thegunblog.ca. I'm Nicholas Johnson and my special guest today is James Castles, Glock's Canadian Sales Manager. Hi Jim, thank you for coming on. Hi Nicholas, good morning. And uh, I'll be asking Jim about the handgun market and sp sp focusing on how it's been for him the past three months. It was three months ago that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he'll be killing the handgun market through legislation and regulation. And Jim has been on the front lines of that as the, as the sales manager for Glock in Canada. The Austrian company makes the world's best-selling handguns, but I just want to do a, put a couple slides here about Glock in Canada you, to make sure that everybody is aware of how significant this company is in the Canadian handgun market. It's the number one handgun brand in the country. By my estimation, about one in five handguns bought in the country is a Glock. That represents 15 to 20,000 pistols per year on average. Top selling models are the Glock 17 Gen 5, the Glock 19 Canadian with the laser engraved maple leaf, and the Glock 44, the, the new 22 long rifle. 85% market share with police, and Canada is one of Glock's largest recurring annual markets outside the United States. Really, really happy to be here with uh, Jim. And a word about Jim. Jim spent most of his career with the Toronto Police as a SWAT member and a use of force trainer. He also had a period where he was working in the private sector and for the since 2011 he has been the Canadian sales manager for Glock if you've ever been to a trade show a, an expo uh, range day with a Glock booth anywhere in the country you've almost certainly met him because he's it's rare to get him in fact uh, seated at one place for very long he's always in airports or crisscrossing or in the air somewhere Jim uh, thanks again for being here so how has it been for you since May 30th when the Prime Minister announced the, that handgun buying, selling, transfers, imports will become illegal. What has it been like for you for three, the yeah, past three months? Yeah, it's, uh, Nicholas, it turned very hectic very quickly. Um, you know, immediately um, we looked at our distributors' inventory and shipments that were coming. Um, and uh, so we, we, had to, um, we had to ramp up that. Um, and, and that's, that was our biggest challenge is to, how do we ramp up, um, our, uh, our, our production, uh, how do we get it into the country quickly? Um, the dealers were clamoring because, uh, their inventory just flew off the shelves. Um, so it was a question for us to how quickly can we replenish, uh, inventory and, uh, you know, purchases are an extended over extended period of time. Uh, um, from our distributors, so it's it's many months uh, when an order goes in before it actually arrives in in Canada. You know, just the transition, uh, just the transportation, I should say, alone. Uh, we ship everything by truck, so um, you know sometimes it's week, ten days on the road um, to, to to get it up to the border. So let's just zoom in on that for a sec, because people people one of the questions that I got a lot from from my members uh, from members of the gunblog.ca was, you know, the stores are empty, there was this huge panic buying, why aren't there more handguns? And people don't understand that it's it takes months from when a store orders a handgun to the local distributor. The distributor then places the order with the factory such as Glock, and it could yeah. take from the time the order is placed. If I place an order if you place an order so hypothetically on January 1st, you might not get the guns for three, six, nine months. And what you're talking about is, so there's an uncompressible time also that, that from the time of order to delivery and factoring the time on the road. So, yeah. So, um, normally, you know, we're like 90 to 120 days for, okay. uh, for delivery. Um, and, uh, to, to accelerate that process, um, uh, it's just not that easy. You know, we're a big company. Uh, there's a lot of big orders. Of course, we, uh, are, we try and get all, all our guns from the U S because of duty free. So it's a, it's a better deal for our customers. Um, plus we can transport them by truck as a, as opposed to air. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a process that, um, it's not easily to accelerate, you know, you can't just uh, go to the shelf and take them off and ship them, uh, especially, you know, with the uh, guns like um, that are unique to Canada. So the ones that have a 106 barrel, you know, these are one offs for Canada. This is, you know, Glock's commitment to Canada um, is, is huge when they make a gun specific 
uh, for the market. Um, and so it's not something that's sold anywhere else but Canada. Those uh, that G19 with the maple leaf on it is a it's a gun that's specifically made for Canada. Um, so it's not something we can just ramp up overnight. And I wanted to also there's so much in there. I want to I want to delve dive in on. You, you said that uh, typically from the the Georgia factory, we're looking at ninety to one hundred day, one hundred and twenty days. So if if the announcement is May 30th. We are, today we're recording this on the 31st of August, that's 91 days or so. Essentially, if if the distributors in Canada are saying, send more, send more, send more supply, Glock in Georgia could say, we can't, right? Is that, I mean, was Glock in Georgia able to actually accelerate things at all? Um, yeah, uh, we, we, the process, you know, just can't be accelerated overnight. Um, in fact, um, you know, guns orders that were placed by distributors for delivery this fall. Um, you know, we now, you know, have to stop the process and, 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 uh, some of those guns may be on the position of stopping. So, you know, mm. we may end up with, uh, guns that, um, were destined for Canada that, that can't be shipped now. Uh, so it's not like they could move. Oh, well, we were expecting delivery in October. Let's move it up to June. That, that can't really happen. No, not, not generally, <clears throat> not generally. And were you, were, I guess a lot of that was, so even though you're, you're present at gun stores and doing trainings and demos and so forth, the, the actual paperwork happens between the gun store, the dealer and the distributor. You're, you're not really involved in that process are you no i'm involved at the distributor level okay. as far as business goes okay. uh, the, the the purchasing of uh, firearms and and uh the shipment um and that whole process um at the dealer level I, I'm, I'm more of a representative uh will um you know support our dealers with uh, service or or events that they're having there that i can uh, appear at um but the business is done with our distributor. We're, we're what we call a two-step process. So we, we sell to a distributor, distributor sells to the dealer. We, we don't have any uh, really direct dealings with the dealer as far as sales go. Okay. And I'm, I'm also just preparing for this interview. I looked around at some some gun stores that I know, whether it's Alf Laherty's or the Shooting Edge or uh, the Bullseye North and so the big, the big, the, the, the giant independence, Firearms Outlet Canada. It's it's impossible to get a new from the ones i saw it's basically impossible at this point to get a new glock in canada and a couple of some of the gun stores are basically have completely stopped selling handguns you can't buy a handgun at some of these big independents anymore what's um is that fair that a new glock if you look if you're in the market for a new glock in canada as of now forget it you're 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 out of luck it's pretty sad yeah. um yeah there, there's uh i i i you know was besieged by emails and phone calls um and uh trying to steer people where i think there might be some inventory typically those bigger stores um but you know scour the local smaller dealers um but yeah the inventory went pretty quick uh I, i'm actually shocked at how quickly the the inventory got absorbed into the marketplace it's uh it's rather astounding that, that it happens that quickly and just to get some numbers here for a sec, I asked the, the RCMP Canadian Fires Program for the data and up to, I think it was the July 19th, there were about 90,000 transfers. So from May 30th to July 19th, 90,000. By now, it's got to be over 100,000 transfers of, of handguns, specifically of handguns to Canadian licensed owners. Do yeah. you, what's your estimate of how many Glocks uh, are in that number? Um... I'd have to take a look at the numbers to come up with a hard number, but, um, you know, thousands and, and, and thousands, you know, we, we shipped, uh, uh, thousands to, uh, our two distributors, uh, big rock and big rock sports, Canada and Amchar Canada our two commercial distributors. Um, they re both received orders of thousands of guns. Um, so I, I think within that hundred thousand, you know, pretty well, any pistol that was on the shelf, um, you know, even the ones that w were collecting dust at, at some of the dealers were probably being sold. Um, you know, because people, are, I, I think, had a feeling of panic uh, that if yeah. they didn't buy something now. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised the number of people I heard from that, um, hey, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of years and uh, wow, I'm going to pull the trigger now because if I don't, um, I might not ever be able to. So. 
Um, it, it's not um, it's not the ideal way that we want to sell our product. Um, you know, I, I, it, it's unfortunate that it's it's happened the way it has. Um, it's certainly not something that you know that we relish. Uh, I, I, I'd rather see it, you know, a steady flow of business than just these peaks and valleys. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's I. From what I've heard as well, it's people. A lot of people who were like, "Now's the time." I'm just going to put up a timeline here of uh, of of what happened when. So May 30th is when is the announcement when Trudeau, uh, the Trudeau government, announces the the plan to to prohibit tra- tr- um, transfers as soon as possible. And then in June, the Liberals on the House of Commons SECU, that's the Public Safety and National Security Committee, work. They're trying to fast track the OIC. August 5th, the Liberals say they'll prohibit handgun imports starting August 19th. August 19th, that prohibition kicks in. That was uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then we're expecting the the, the prohibitions, the, the trans- prohibition on transfers to begin in in October based on that, based on the, the estimated timeline for the OIC. And the reason I put confiscations there is if you can't transfer a gun, that means you can't tra- your estate can't transfer it to your kids, to your spouse. What's going to happen? Well, I, one of the possible options is is confiscation. So this is a we're talking about the end of eventually the end of handgun ownership in Canada, and and that's that's I just wanted to put that that timeline up. Did anything change for for you in ter- well based on what you're saying with the imports, the shipments, with that August import prohibition? Did any did that show up on your radar at all? Um. No, not, not, there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, big changes. Um, I mean, the, the paperwork was all in, in, in process uh, already. Um, a couple of years ago, the um, importation, well, actually the exportation changed. It went from the U.S. State Department to the Commerce Department, um, which uh, facilitated uh, making the, the paperwork a little easier, a little more streamlined. Um, and so it was a lot easier on the U.S. side. The Canadian side hasn't changed much. Um, a lot of it's relevant to the export permit. Um, you know, we export guns uh, from the U.S. to Canada. They're not for re-export. They're only for Canadian consumption. Um, so not not a whole lot changed in, in the process. So it's not like on August 19th when with the import prohibition takes effect, you're not, they're not turning trucks back at the border of that. You, you didn't. That no, we, that. we didn't uh, cut it that close. Okay. So, I mean, the distributors have a lot of money tied up when they make a purchase of thousands of guns. Um, so we weren't about to cut it right to the last day. Um, and, I, and and the distributors were, you know, I'm not going to force them, uh, even if the pistols were available. It's a business decision for them if they want to uh, take the risk of, uh, you know, what, what if the truck broke down or, or, or something happened? Um and uh so yeah we cut it off probably a week uh prior to the 19th um that we just weren't going to ship you know it's it's a business so you know there's some business decisions made as well Um, and a lot of people i think in the as a as a recreational shooter or or hunter you we might not we don't often realize that the the business angle and if you're a business from what i've been told by the stores if you're a business who sells handguns you know it's going to take potentially a couple months for them to, from the time you order, for them to arrive. You can't take the risk, like you say, about a truck breaking down or that they get held up for three weeks at the border. You could get, you can't take the risk of being stuck with millions of dollars of unsold inventory. So just back to this question of people asking, hey, I want to buy a handgun. Why, why can't I? Why, why isn't there any more supply coming? Well, that's why. The, the dealers and the distributors just couldn't take that uh, I guess policy risk, the, the all, all the uncertainties around shipments. Yeah, no, uh, and and uh, I mean, uh, that's what happens when you know they um, they just arbitrarily wake up one day and decide to cut off permits, um, and and that's uh, that appears that's what the government did is is they just you know came up with this idea uh, to cut permits and and uh, that was a way to stop. Um, I have to be honest, I was kind of astounded that um, if, if this was such an easy way to stop handguns from being imported into Canada for legal gun owners, um, like wh- wh- why did the Liberal government not do it six years ago when they started talking about gun control to their 
voters and on their platform. I mean, if it, if it was this very simple process of just cutting off permits, uh, wh why the delay? Like that's six years of a lot of guns coming into the country. If you're, uh, uh, you know, if you're leaning towards you don't like guns and things like that, I mean, that would be to me, uh, maybe it's the policeman in me, but I, I, that's the obvious question I would ask is, hey, uh, how, how come now? Um, you know, they already had a process in place for October. Um, then why all of a sudden? I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I know if I was somebody that um, wasn't supportive of, of the legal handgun ownership, then I, I would be I would want to be asking why? Why why'd you wait six years to be able to do this to the flip of a switch? Kind of thing. That's a that's a so you're playing you're playing playing devil's advocate. If you're an anti gun activist, you'd say if it, if all it took was the stroke of a pen, yeah. Why didn't Why didn't you move that pen six years ago? If it's a it's a do you, do you have any? I'm I'm guessing my the cynic in me says, oh well, they're they're trying to exploit the politics or some ideological reason or the election reason or something that there's no. It's that's the only thing that that makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not in a position to be able to to uh, comment really, other than that I just look at it from a, a perspective of um, okay, you've changed all the rules right now, and and uh, I, I'm not sure what changed between August, um, you know, May and August. Like, what what changed? I mean, uh, um, unfortunately, gun crime in Canada, it, 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 you know, is is it appears to be on the up. I mean, it's certainly captured by the media. There's been some terrible, terrible events in, in Canada, uh, most recently the one on the East Coast. And, and um, But they don't involve legal gun owners. Um, they, they involve people that have uh, illegally acquired their firearms. They're not legal guns. Um, you know, I personally, I think one of the reasons that uh, it's, you know, we don't see legal guns used uh, is that, you know, gun owners are pretty responsible people. Um, they follow the rules. It's a really detailed process to be able to own a firearm uh, in Canada, a pistol. Um, and so um, they, they protect themselves and, and guard against uh, uh, doing anything that would uh, cause them to lose that privilege because it is a privilege in Canada. And, um, but the, uh, the guns that uh, are used in crime are, are all pretty much illegal guns smuggled across the border. And that's what the, you know, Kane Chiefs of Police uh, Association says it's my own experience. I, I trace firearms uh, for law enforcement. Uh, the guns are used in crime, and um, yeah, uh, like a, more than ninety percent seem to come from uh, south of the border. Uh, that 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 is the problem. You know, when it comes to it, and and I don't think, um, you know, just. Um, you know, arbitrarily picking a date and saying, okay, we can't have legal gun ownership anymore. Uh, I'm not, I'm just not sure that's going to solve anybody's problem when it comes to gun crime. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's going to be a hard thing to square, um, you know, a year or two from now, if this ban continues and, uh, and there's still gun crime and they're involving illegal guns coming across the border. I, I'm not sure how you square that with what you've already, you know, what they've gone ahead and done. You know, there'd be a lot of businesses impacted by this. There's a lot of lives, a lot of a lot of people's uh, family businesses and, and employment of people. Um, um, I mean, I, my, like you said, my background is law enforcement. So when, when I came into this business, um, I was astounded at, uh, A, the number of people purchasing handguns um, and B, the, um, the, 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 the family kind of sport that it is, um, that I would go to events and you know, you'd see uh, mothers, fathers, sons, families, grandparents. Um, they're just there for a day of fun and have an experience that they might not have had before. Um, it's not, it, it wasn't the, uh, you know, I, I understood that that was pretty much the case, but it was when, when you see it firsthand, it was, it was totally different. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, a very family friendly event. I think you're muted. Still muted? Okay, I should, okay. Sorry, thank you. Um, no can you say more about that? You so you come from you you come from the world of policing. You for a few years in the private sector where you do something else, but then you you join Glock, and how, your views on gun owners, gun ownership, guns. You one you go from dealing with 
a few bad guys to lots and lots of good guys. And like you're saying, moms and dads and, and kids and teenagers, how did that, can you say more about that experience, that shift in perspective for you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like I, I can think offhand of a couple of events uh, I, I've done over the years. One I, was a, an event we did up in Barrie, Ontario, and it was for just women. It was a women's event only. Um, it was basically just, you know, to come out and have the experience. Um, you know, it was one of those, it, they, they couldn't bring their boyfriend, they couldn't bring their husband, it was just women, you know. Um, and uh, it was a, you know, a, they ran for a couple of years. Uh, first year was, a, you know, pretty uh, meager attendance. But by the third year, they had hundreds, hundreds of women come out to this event. Um, and it was all just for, you know, kind of an empowerment experience and, and just to do it uh, for the sake of doing it. I don't think any, <clears throat> I don't think there was a huge percentage who were going to run out and, and um, purchase handguns, although some of them said, yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a fun sport. Um, and and uh, yeah, it was, it was a very enlightening uh, experience to, to see generations of family come out uh, to, uh, to enjoy it. And uh um, you know, I was in Costco uh, a couple of days ago and I met a guy and we started talking and, and somehow we got onto firearms. Not something I usually bring up, um, but um, somehow we got onto that topic. And, and this gives a, a businessman fairly high pressure job. Uh, I got the impression. And uh, he talked about going to the range as just a way to sort of uh, clear his head and, and decompress and focus intently on the on the paper target and, and then you know, uh, kind of put him in a right spot. And, uh, and that was it, you know, for an hour or two, he, he'd go to the range. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's sport. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a recreational thing. And I don't, I, I'm so glad you shared that because we can't, we, we can't emphasize that enough and educate people enough that gun ownership in Canada really is, is two different universes. You have the millions and millions of people who, are the, I'm going to call them the, the known good guys, right? The people with the firearm possession and acquisition license, and our friends and family, the people like this guy at Costco, we, the, the people you saw at the Barry at the Barry uh, event. We go to the range, we go hunting, we do matches and competitions. It's family day, it's competitive, it's 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 healthy, it's wholesome, it's it's good, it's beneficial. That's the huge population, and then you have this other tiny little market. I, it's oversimplistic to call them bad guys, but the the people who are doing violence and and crime and hurting people this tiny this tiny little population but they're the ones who get all the media attention and of course the the government is pretending that by going after the first group the good guys they're actually targeting the bad guys so there's this incredible misleading deception happening and that is very frustrating that about these these two universes and they're the government is actually trying to smear them and make make them look like there's one universe yeah, I, I mean, I I try and keep my my politics uh, at a, at a minimum. You know, this is a business, um, and um, that's why I'm I'm in the business. Glock's a great company; it's very supportive of of our customers, law enforcement, and 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 uh, likewise across the country. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, I would be happy if the media, when they're reporting on guns, would just either. Def- find it as a legal firearm or an illegal firearm. I suspect the public would have a, a, a bit of a different view if every night on the news they heard an illegal firearm, an illegal firearm, an illegal firearm. Um, but they just hear firearm. And, and um, so it'd be, you know, the media would be a little more accurate if they're reporting uh, on, on, a, on a, a firearm that was used in a crime, uh, whether it was a legally owned one or an illegally owned one. And it might motivate changes in the, um, you know, in the government to uh, police illegal firearms. I, I don't know. But, you know, you can't leave the public with the perception that, you know, um, you got all these legal gun owners and then you got gun crime and somehow they're connected um, because they aren't. They aren't connected. And I would fully support that. I would even, I would, as, a, as an advocate in this space, I would even say, let's go further. Uh, avoid phrases like, gun crime and gun violence which are invented and propagated by the anti-gun activists and let's avoid even saying if we're making make that distinction between legal versus illegal it's not the gun that's legal or illegal it's the possession or the ownership 
right? Because humans do stuff, guns don't do stuff legally or illegally, humans do stuff legally or illegally. But I fully support the idea of creating those distinctions and education and understanding, basically helping people understand the regulatory regime, the reality of what's happening, both the good stuff and the not good stuff. It's, um, do, do you, when you talk to your, your other colleagues at Glock, is every, is every country that you, you know, the people, your colleagues, is something similar happening where there's political uncertainty or suppression of lawful firearm ownership or, or how does, how do you, what kind of conversations do you have with your colleagues? Um, well, I, I, I'm the only Canadian that works for Glock and I'm, yeah. I'm surrounded by a sea of Americans. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, they're, you know, they're inquisitive about Canada. Of course, certainly the, the, the ban made big news. Um, I recently just came back from our management meeting in Montana and, um, you know, explained to them the whole process, what's, what's happening, you know, where's our business in Canada. Um, we have a very, very strong law enforcement business. So, um, you know, Glock's not going anywhere. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the big difference in Canada versus the U.S. is, uh, the U.S. has, uh, I mean, there's there's uh, there's regulation changes happening in the U.S. Uh, different states, different cities um, are, are doing different things about firearms. Um, but what I see as a, as an outside kind of observer of the U.S. is the big difference between Canada and the U.S. is uh, the U.S. has gun crime, but involves legal gun ownership, um, and, and and Canada has gun crime, but they're illegally you know, acquired firearms. Um, that's what I see really as, as the big distinction. Um, the U S is, uh, is, is wrestling with, uh, the administration of uh, firearms ownership. Um, we're wrestling with, uh, gun crime committed by criminals that have acquired guns illegally. Um, so it, it, it's kind of two different, uh, you know, they're both crimes, they're both gun involved guns, but, uh, you know, the, the, they're, they're totally separate between the two countries as to what the problem is. So we're, we're, we don't want to derail the conversation here into policing where we're, I'm going to lose because you, you have far more experience I don't have. But the, the question I would have also is, the way I see it, it's a mistake even to focus on the hardware. The question really, I believe, upstream is why are people wanting to hurt each other? Like what, why do we have people in our, in our, in our communities, in our cities, in our, in our, in our country who want to hurt each other, whether it's with bullets, with, with b b whatever, whatever tool they're using. So I, I would, um, and I, I, I think we need to get the gun conversation out of the, the violence conversation. So I'm going to come back to the, um, I'm going to come back to the business, the business side. I'm going to go back to the slide here. The, um, Glock in terms of the, in terms of those 15 to 20,000 guns per average, you know, over, over time that came into Canada, can you say what percentage came from Austria versus what percentage came from the the factory in in the state of Georgia? Oh, overwhelming! Um, you know, ninety five percent come from Georgia. Um, uh, guns that we would bring in from Austria might, might be specialized guns that aren't yet approved, maybe for the U.S. Um, you know, the regulations in Canada and the U.S. Uh, are, are a little different. Um, so I may access guns in Austria uh, for law enforcement. Um, there is an occasion where we've had, um, like, uh, we do ship components from Austria to be assembled in the U.S. So you, you, if you get a gun and it says made in Austria or not, um, the, the components maybe were made in Austria, but it was assembled in the U.S. Um, and then we have the actual made in USA because the factory in Georgia uh, it has the capability of producing our firearms, Um and it doesn't produce all of them, but um, it, it can produce a, a large number. I mean, uh, the, uh, pardon me, the uh, U.S. Um, consumer would like to have a, a, a made in USA firearm. Um, but the, the, the capacity may be there, may not be there for some models. Interesting enough, like, for example, uh, a 22 caliber, so a 22 caliber pistol or a 380, in order for that to be sold in the United States, those calibers have to be manufactured in the U.S. So in order to sell a 22 caliber or G44, uh, according to the U.S., uh, it has to be manufactured in the United States, not something that would, is required in Canada. We, we don't require, they have to be manufactured in certain countries. I mean, obviously, we don't have a big firearms manufacturing business here in Canada. 
And do you, do you know if any guns, like did Glock, the mother mothership in Austria, did they f- fly any guns after the, the prohibitions were announced? Did they fly any pistols no. into Canada to? No. no. Okay. No, we didn't, we didn't do that. Okay. Just, no. okay. Um, the, uh, I'd also wanted to ask you about the future of Glock and one, one question that is, I'm just going back to my slides here. So I've, I've covered Glock at the gunblog.ca, I covered Glock for, for years and years and years and had many, many wonderful and, uh, uh conversations with you. One question that has been on the radar for years is the RCMP replacement handgun. And I know Glock is interested in that. Can you say where things stand with that tender? Yeah. What, how does Glock view that? So, um, right now the RCMP is in the process. So, uh, it's public, um, that they, they've, uh, released, um, uh, an RFI, which is what they call a request for information from the industry about what they think or what the industry thinks, uh, as far as, um, uh, an offering, uh, in the future. Um, we're fortunate that the RCMP are a customer of ours. We were, we were able to, um, gonna... provide the air marshals, uh, with our G19 gen four. They've had it for probably five years now plus. Um, and, um, you know, we have a very broad market here in, in Canada with, uh, with police agencies all across the country, uh, Glock pistols have been used for, you know, 25, uh, up more than 25 years here in Canada. I carried one myself for 20 years. Um, and, uh, so we think we have a great pistol. Um, it's well supported. Um, and, uh, we look forward to the opportunity to compete, uh, for the RCMP's business. And, uh, it, it will be a competition, um, you know, in order for them to, acquire a pistol for the air marshals. There was an exhaustive testing uh, protocol. Uh, so I anticipate the, it'll be the same. And um, we're just uh, appreciative of the opportunity to, to compete and would like to provide uh, the RCMP with our product. Uh, we, we think we have a good product that's well tested, well used all across Canada by tens of thousands of police officers. Can you say which model or models you'll be submitting? Well, it'd be nine millimeter. Uh, the RCMP are, are, are nine millimeter now, and the, unlike um, some of the agencies in Canada that, that you know went from revolvers to pistols, they adopted forty caliber. Um, there's a movement within that community to go to nine millimeter um, as they purchase new pistols. So it would be a nine millimeter uh, platform. Um, exact pistol that we would offer is going to be based on the specifications that come out. Uh, in a tender, so they would specify length and and, um, and and weight and height and things like that. So we have a, a number of pistols that would meet that category. Um, our most popular pistol right now seems to be uh, the G45 for law enforcement. So that's a pistol that is it's like the 19X for the civilians out there, um, but it's in black and and it's probably one of the first questions we got asked when we introduced the 19X is oh you're going to make it in black for law enforcement so. Um, the G45 is that uh, pistol, so it has a slightly shorter slide um, with a full grip um, with a large magazine capacity. Um, so that, that that would be kind of a candidate for for it. Um, and uh, but like I said, we'll wait and see what the the spec is. I'm sure we'll have a pistol that'll that'll meet the specifications. And um, yeah, we're excited about the opportunity to to compete and and uh, to. Uh, offer our, our product to the RCMP. It was one of my personal um, kind of uh, bucket list things for when I took this job was the, uh, you know, the, to bring on board like the, the Montreal City Police, the OPP, the RCMP. Uh, the, you know, they're the last kind of three big agencies we'd like to have had in our family. And the OPP and Montreal uh, City Police, SPVM, are, are, are been in the family now for a number of years. So, um, we're kind of part way there with the RCMP with the air marshals, but, um, we, we got a little ways to go and we'll, we'll work hard. We'll work hard. And, uh, thank you for that. The, the other big tender that's happening now is the military uh, pistol tender Yes. with, can, yeah. Can you update, uh, with your views on that? And we're, so, uh, sad <laughs> to say, uh, we won't be uh, competing in that process. Uh, the Canadian army, uh, has excluded Glock from, uh, being able to offer uh, our pistol. Um, so they've, they've set out requirements that, that kind of exclude our pistol. Um, so we made the decision. Uh, we, we initially uh, protested the, uh, the um, 
the tender they had put out, um, we were successful in, in uh, winning the protest. And so uh, the government had to make some changes to it. But um, the changes they made were not significant enough to allow us uh, to even compete. So we're, we, we couldn't technically meet uh, their specifications. So uh, unfortunate, but um, it is what it is. It's uh, it's business. And, um, you know, I, I think we had a great product that we could have offered the Canadian Army. Uh, Glock provides... Uh, pistols to many of the Canadian allies. Um, probably closest to Canada would be uh, the U.S. Uh, not not the U.S. Army just doesn't use uh, our competitors' pistol. There's plenty of elements within the U.S. military that that use Glock pistols. Um, the British military, Dutch military. There, there's many many uh, allies around the world that use our pistol, but um, unfortunately, we're not given the opportunity. So we just move on. And just to, to thank you for that. Just just some background here. Yeah, the the when I looked at it, the, the tender was the tender by the um, the government for the military pistol was written in such a way that it based it basically wants a gun with a trigger assembly, a removable trigger assembly, which everything to me sounded like it was they wanted a Sig P320. Other people also see a, the Beretta. I think it's the APX model, but um, definitely, uh, like you said, it, you guys saw, concluded that this is not a bid that you can win. No. Um, and, and so, you know, you put your effort where your effort's best put. And, and uh, so my recommendation to, to Glock Austria and the U.S. was that, uh, that, w- that we move on and, and focus on the opportunities we have uh, in-house. And um, I mean, who, who knows what's going to happen with the Canadian military? It's been many, many, many years they've been trying to get a pistol. Uh, since I started with Glock, um, you know, almost 12 years ago, I, I, I've been talking to the Canadian Army about a, a, a pistol replacement. So um, it's a very, very slow process. Very slow. Why is it so slow for that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, Interesting. I don't know. Uh, okay. It's very bureaucratic. I've met dozens of people that, that have been involved in the program and come and gone. Um, uh, yeah, I mean... It's a pistol, right? Is it about um, the technical requirements or the budgeting or the approvals? Is I it, think it's all of the above. All of the above, yeah. All of the above. I mean, uh, the, the, it's fairly fr- – I can imagine it's very frustrating for the military, you know, the operators themselves. Um, I mean, you're basically talking about a pistol that you can walk into any gun shop and buy. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not going to be modified. Canada's market is – is relatively small in comparison to other world markets uh, in, in the military. So yeah. uh, they're not going to be buying 600,000 like the U S army. Um, so um, it's a relatively small market and, and, and there are no um, handgun manufacturers here in Canada that, that, right. that can cater to that. So um, they have to go and it's probably, you know, going to be a, a U.S. company, I would think. Mm. Okay, as opposed to so that you, as opposed to an Italian company. <laughs> oh well, I mean, I, I shouldn't say I don't say it to, to exclude the uh, uh, the Beretta. I mean, uh, but I, that that would be provided out of Canada, probably through hmm. uh, Stoger or something like that. So it could be one or uh, you know either either or. Okay. I mean, they're both uh, they're both good firearms, um, and um, you know we would have liked just the opportunity to compete. You know, that's all we ask is is that uh, we have a pistol that's used. 365 days a year uh, by tens of thousands of law enforcement all across the country and has been for 25 years. To me, it just didn't make any sense to exclude that product from the, from the testing. Uh, you know, if you refine your testing and find that that's not what suits your needs, fine. But, but to exclude us, um, you know, it's kind of like you're going to buy a pickup truck, but you exclude Ford. Um, <clears throat> well, why would you do that? Um, I don't know, but uh, there's smarter people out there than me, I guess. And, and, uh, they've decided that they wanted to narrow it down. And, uh, I think we could have given the army a great product at a very competitive price, uh, which is another thing, you know, the more people you allow to compete, the, the price gets very competitive, which is better for the taxpayer. Um, but, um, again, we weren't given the opportunity. So, um, business decision I made, we move on. Okay. All right. The um, and I also should have disclosed this at the beginning. I'm I'm uh, the, the first gun I ever bought was a Glock. The last gun I ever bought uh, so far was a Glock. Well, we um, appreciate that. And uh, and so I'm I'm a Glock fan. And uh, 
and um, and that. But the the market for Glock is closing. The market for any handgun in Canada, of the civilian side, I'm moving back to the uh, the civilian slash commercial side, is closing in a few weeks with the the government's prohibitions. What future is there for Glock then in Canada? Um, well, we're we're not going anywhere. So you know, one of the one of the smartest decisions Mr. Glock made many many years ago. When he came to North America, he recognized there's a distinct difference between Canada and the United States. So we've always had a Canadian uh, managing our business here. Uh, that's my role. Um, so uh, we will transition to whatever we can do for our uh, our, our loyal um, commercial customers, uh, whether that be support um, by way of parts and service um or you know other items that we sell some of our uh, apparel and accessories things like that you know we, we we will transition in into whatever markets that are left for us um on the law enforcement side uh it's just uh you know business as usual uh for for us um and i mean the good thing is 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 our pistols that uh, civilians buy and law enforcement buy are the same guns. Um, uh, you know, Glock only makes one quality, one 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 product, uh, and it may go to different markets, and it, and it may have like a higher capacity magazine for for professionals and law enforcement, um, and, and and maybe some different sites or something. But otherwise, the parts are all the same. So we have the process in place to be able to support our our, our uh, customers right here in Canada, and and we're we're not going anywhere. Um, so. Um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what the what markets are left for us. Um, you know what the government decides to do, um, mm -hmm. and I guess the other thing is, is uh, you know how long is this government uh, going to be in in power, and and are there going to be changes in in, in the future? Um, one would hope, um, and we plan on being there to support uh, our customers uh, in whatever role we can. If slash when there is a change in government, let's say it's years, it could be years down the road, how long would it, and let, I mean, what would happen between now and then is the, the people, the infrastructure involved in the handgun importation and distribution process will be gone or doing other stuff. How long would it take, do you think, to reestablish a handgun market if, uh, if a change in government? Oh, I, I, I don't think very long at all. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the permit process has been somewhat simplified by going to Commerce Department from the State Department, um, assuming that our uh, distributors uh, are still interested um, uh, in, in re-engaging in the market, then, um, yeah, I, I think we get ramped up pretty quick. I mean, okay. uh, it take a while to produce uh, to the product, you know, it's particularly the ones that have uh, 106 barrels in them and things like that. We'd have to ramp up some production. But, yeah, I don't think uh, it would take us that long. I don't think there'd be any big impediments. Um, to to getting re-engaging in the market. Okay, and I and I, I I love also to ask to benefit from your like you said like I said in the beginning you crisscross the country you're in touch with shooters and stores and dealers and distributors in all aspects of the industry. When I look at what's happening, let's just take this handgun situation as an example. Roughly one third of the market, the guns, of course, the parts, the accessories, the the sights, the ammo, that's just getting overnight switched off. That means one third of gun store employees are potentially looking at lost jobs and all the one third of basically one third of the market is disappearing overnight. Um, I, I see more and more pressure on the legal firearm market on legal firearm owners by the current government. And I want to be wrong. I, I, I don't want to be a pessimist, but everything I see makes me a pessimist. I would love to ask you for how you see the future of lawful gun ownership in Canada. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you are. Uh, Good. I, I, I think things will get better. Uh, they might get a little worse before they get better, but I, I think eventually they'll get better, um, for, for handgun owners. Um, uh, for, for handgun owners or for firearm owners in general, you mean? I, I think for, like, I look at the handgun market, so, okay. um, I, I think, uh, things will, Will, will improve in, in, in the future with the change of government. Um, but I don't expect radical changes. I, th I personally think there are areas today that the federal government could tighten up and change that would support the initiative of, of gun crime involving illegal firearms. Um, there are things they could do. 
um, to, to tighten it up and things that I would hope that the community would embrace. Um, but such, I, such I as, do think such that, as... The, that the community, uh, I mean, the message that they've been um, de delivering for the last few years has not resonated. Uh, it, it, it has not resonated with politicians and, and I think large swaths of the public. So I think the the, the face of gun ownership, um, I mean, we have to look inwards and, and see, you know, how, how are we perceived? How do people perceive us? Um, and we need to deliver a message that's more suited to really who we are, the sports shooters that shoot at, you know, highly vetted by the RCMP, uh, a, a laborious process to in, in order to own a firearm, securely locked up at home in a safe that's governed by the laws of Canada um and uh and go out and shoot pieces of paper or steel on uh, you know generally on the weekends um so you know how do we how do we deliver a message that more reflects that you know um and i, I think that's what we need to do as an industry when we look inwards and say hey how, how, how do we do that because clearly the message that we've been delivering for the last few years is it, not working uh it's got us to where we are today um I can. I, I'd love to engage. I'm, I'd love to engage with you. And, and if anybody else is watching, I'd love to follow up this discussion about the future of gun ownership in Canada. Because I got my PAL as an adult. I got it about ten years ago in uh, in 2012. And there was what I've what I've observed in the past uh, ten years as a gun owner, a, a recreational slash sports shooter, is a lot of hush hush. There's not a lot of communication by gun owners. It's like this secret hush hush activity that we do far away from from everybody else, and for good reason, right? And and we don't like to talk about it. And and I think I believe now that has that has bitten us in the butt because our our families, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors just don't understand the reality of what gun ownership in this country is. And I think that goes away the long the way you're saying is. We not only do we have to improve our messaging. Holy smokes, we've got to start messaging. We've got to start communicating. Uh, yeah, and it's unfortunate. Nate, you know, the horse is out of the barn now. So, it's we're too late. Um, yeah, it's you know, it's a it's it's never too late to, no. to change our message. And and uh, but I think we have to be very careful of what the message is. And 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 um, and and so that that's going to require some inward reflection. I'm happy to work with. Um, the uh you know the industry any way i can um and, and but i am um i am you know I, I i do have some limits on how far i will go and 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 what i think the message should be um i am very aware of the problem in law enforcement uh, i come from that background so um I, you know uh, legal gun owners in canada are not the problem of law enforcement um but, but, you know, there are things that we could say and do to support law enforcement better uh, in our messaging. Jim, can you come a little closer to the mic? I'm losing some of the, yeah. uh, the subject. And do you think your colleagues or your, your former colleagues in law enforcement would agree with that? Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 I think. Uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, I mean, so <laughs> talking about law enforcement, you know, there's a lot of police officers that own firearms so they can practice uh, because, you know, they're, they're, they're limited as how much practice they can do. Uh, on, on duty and at work. Um, they you mean the type of person, so let's say you use a G17 at work, well, you'll go and buy your own, pers you'll get your PAL, you'll oh, yeah, buy your, yeah. no, your and, own and personal. A, a, lot of, uh, I, a lot of officers have done that. And, yeah. and uh, But so they're all affected by it now too. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're so you know, private security, things like that. They, 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 they're armed, they practice on their own and, and their skill level uh, to improve themselves. Um, so, I mean, you got to remember firearms for law enforcement, it, it's a life-saving device, yeah. you know, it's, it's protect the public and themselves. Um, so, so. Uh, they're affected by it as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I support, uh, whatever, any way that, that I could personally, or, or, uh, you know, through Glock, um, uh, we, we, uh, we want to support the industry the best we can. Got it. Uh, and excuse me one second, I'm just going to cough. Um, thanks for saying that. And I want to ask you if just before we close out, anything that we didn't say that needs to be said? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I thinking out loud, I'm wondering that the government's objective is to reduce violence, uh, and, uh, you know, particular gun violence. Uh, 
I wonder about the subsidized uh, movie industry that we have in Canada, which is fairly large, uh, that, that involves the use of firearms and, and uh, you know, shoot em ups and things like that. Um, I mean, I'm not against the movie industry, but I mean, if we're talking about firearms and, and reducing violence, um, you know, a lot of levels of government uh, subsidize uh, movie making in Canada. And so I'm just wondering, are they next on the list? Is, uh, is the government going to go after, you know, guns involved in, in movies and the proliferation of uh, violence on our screens? Um, I, I would say the glorification, that's a, a glorification of violence in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so like, like John Wick, John Wick is a hero to, uh, <laughs> to, to a lot of people. I, I, you know, I don't know, like, uh, but where's this all going to go? Um, you know, taking guns away from legal gun owners is not going to solve the, the crime problem. It's a, um, it's a great question. You're pointing to the hypocrisy between the, a movie industry that essentially glorifies violence and actually going off for the people who are not violent. Right. It's yeah, it's, it's total hypocrisy, it seems. And subsidized uh, through uh, the government through various credits for movie making. Yeah. So the taxpayers, you know, pick now, up the tab in some cases. Now, is that just a question on your part? Or do you know something? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, okay. that's, uh, that would be a question. I mean, this is like, is this an agenda that the government is is on to wipe out guns and gun violence and, and things like that. Um, you know, have they even considered that? I mean, clearly, um, for many, many years, they didn't consider cutting off the import permits. So um, uh, I'm just wondering, is, is this something that is down the road that we'll, yeah. we'll see, um, you know, handguns not be able to use or firearms not be able to use in movie making in Canada? Um, or no movies or video games unless it's about uh, unicorns and rainbows. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's just thinking out loud here. Yeah. Just thinking out loud. Okay. Well, it's. I think it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, you're the only one I know who's asking that question um, about the, 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 what seems like a huge gap in thinking between the actions and what, and the words, what they say they're doing and what they're actually doing. I, I just wish there was a little closer um, tie with law enforcement. I mean, uh, mm. when I talk to law enforcement, um, they're, they're desperate to see some changes made and some of the things out there, some simple changes that could be made, um, regulatory stuff. Um, and it, it, it just doesn't seem to happen. They go to this whole, you know, extreme. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure, like when I talk to the general public, most of the public doesn't, they don't realize that you don't even need your pal to go buy gun parts. Um, you, like you like know, a spring or a magazine or something? A magazine, yeah. uh, things like that, gun parts. Uh, you don't even need a pal for that. And I don't think anybody that's in the industry would have any problem with saying you have to show your pal in order to buy some gun parts. Um, Do, don't most stores have a higher standard, though, than what's required well, I, by I law? Think most stores, I think most stores that I go into, they generally ask. Yeah, I mean, it's not yeah. a legal requirement, but, you know, they, they, they think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, um, like the store owners I've spoken to, go up, they, I mean, the first thing, they don't sleep at night unless they know that they've done everything they could to, to, to not sell any gear to someone who's going to go do something bad. Like they their reputations, their livelihoods depend on it. So they, I, the yeah, ones I yeah. know go above and beyond the law. And, and I yeah. think that shows the integrity of, of yeah. uh, you know, the industry and some of the, uh, some of our dealers, but, yeah. but that's it's just a, one it's a, example. It's a great, and it's a great, it's a great point. It's a great question. And, and the public would be shocked to realize that, you know, Hey, my neighbor can go buy gun parts and he's got nothing to do with guns. Um, doesn't own any and doesn't want to own any. Um, but legally he can go buy gun parts. So, you know, where's that fit with gun crime? Um, and, uh, when you talk about 3d printing and ghost guns and people yeah, dying out so to buy parts, uh, I, that don't need a firearms license, uh, you know, that's a conversation that needs to be had. I, I, it, I'm going to say here that I believe it is a, it's a conversation that needs to be had though. I think though, that as soon as we, as the gun debate, as soon as we get dragged into the crime and violence debate, we're losing. That's and there's no product that does good in sales, I think, when you have crime and violence involved. Um, I think that's a, I think tactic, that's my opinion. I know you, you have a different opinion or different people have different opinions. Yeah. But I think we need to focus on the, 
the, the millions of people who are not involved, who have nothing, to, who, who are all about sport and camaraderie and fellowship yeah. and, and competition. And uh, but, but I mean, that's not to discount the questions you're raising. You're absolutely raising valid uh, and important uh, points. Yeah, no, it's um, like I said, we're we need to change the messaging, change uh, the messaging that I can. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, you know, where we are today, it, it just doesn't work. And there's so much I think there's I want to focus more on this in future uh, articles and, and uh, videos and stuff. There is so much good to say about the benefits of gun ownership, the benefits of gun owners, whether it's again, you know, the protection and safety or sport or, or hunting and organic food and outdoors and education. Like there's just so many positive aspects to uh, to gun ownership that uh, that I believe in and that I think we need to promote more. No, 100%. 100%. All right. 100%. All right. Jim, uh, I, I'm going to wish you uh, personally and Glock, uh, you personally and professionally, a, a bright future in Canada and around the world. And I really want to thank you for having been my guest today. No, I appreciate your time, Nicholas. I know you're a busy guy and uh, we, we appreciate uh, your support. And um, like I said, we're we're not going anywhere. We're going to support our, our commercial customers uh, any way we can. And we'll just, I guess we'll just wait and see, you know, how far it's going to go and, and uh, what what's going to happen in, in October. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we should sit back and, you know, think about the messaging and uh, and get out and vote next time we have an opportunity to vote. And and subscribe to the gunblog.ca online. Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> man. You are actually you're the voice. I remember when you first started, Nicholas, and uh um your 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 enthusiasm is infectious, uh, because you're you're very enthusiastic and, and you do an awesome job. So we appreciate the uh the support out there and, and you you know, keeping us uh up to speed with what's going on. It's hard to uh I mean it's a go to place. For, for me to find out what's going on uh, without going through pages of documents on the web. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to, for you to say that and a very, I love hearing that and, uh, and I'm, off, I'm happy to offer that service, so thank you. All right, well, have All a right. great upcoming long weekend. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Cheers.